Well, good morning, everybody. It's great to be here with you, and thank you for taking time this weekend to be a part of our services today. Uh, Add my welcome to Matthews, and thank you so much for um, joining us today, uh, either online or here live at the John Young campus. It's great to have you here. It's been a great series we've been walking through, this idea of summer of impact and how we can have an impact and looking at what I call kind of the hidden figures uh, in Scripture, some of the less well-known characters of the Bible and uh, how their experience uh, was an impact and how we can mirror that in our own lives. And I'm excited today to talk to you about a married couple and how they as a couple impacted people for the gospel. I invite you to open your Bibles or your tablet or your phone to Acts chapter 18, the book of Acts chapter 18. And we're going to look at several different sections of that chapter and we'll do it a section at a time. And uh, Pastor David is out today enjoying some time with his family and doing great, but uh, having a well-deserved break. And I think he'll be back with us uh, next weekend. So a few weekends ago, I told you the story about Janice Roof. Janice was the lady that when she passed away, uh, she uh, left us her 1966 Ford Mustang Pony Edition for us to be able to sell it. And as in her words, use the resources to help people. And she was real specific about what she wanted us to do, and I told you about it. And I said in that uh, day when I told you about it that one of the things that Janice was kind of living out for us and in, in doing that and preparing before she died was this idea that when Jesus is Lord of your life, when he's really Lord of your life, when you, you do what Dan just did and you say, hey, I'm making Jesus Lord of my life, it's more than just about giving 10%. And it's more than just an hour on Sunday morning. When Jesus becomes Lord of your life, it changes everything about us. Uh, Everything we have belongs to him. All that we are is for him. And that's what it means to follow Jesus. And we're going to read about a a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, and they kind of show us how to live when Jesus is Lord. And we're just getting some glimpses into their life because it's not a prescriptive passage, it's a descriptive passage. So it's describing who they are and we're seeing some glimpses of them, but there's not like, okay, here are the six steps. There's nothing like that in this passage. It's more, let me give you a picture of what they're doing and then we can infer from that, okay, if that's what they're doing, then this must be true about them. And so we're gonna look at, at two or three different sections of this scripture and and pull from there. What does it mean? How does it impact me? How am I going to act and and respond when Jesus is Lord of my life? And we're going to begin at Acts 18, Acts 18, 1 through 3. And it says this, "After, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. One of the things that they demonstrate to us, one of the truths that they show, one of the pictures that they give us is that when Jesus is Lord, we steward our spaces. We steward the spaces. In their case, they stewarded their home. When Jesus is Lord, we steward our spaces. You know what a steward is? A steward is not an owner. A steward is one who cares for something that belongs to the owner. And when we're, when Jesus is Lord, we don't own things. We steward things. We steward our spaces. You know, it says in this passage that Paul came to be with them and he, probably because they were Christian and because they were Jewish and because they were tent makers. But, but do you know that he actually came and he stayed with them for 18 months? How's that for a house guest? Right? You think he's coming for a day? He stays for 18 months. You know how that, that only happens. <clears throat> that only happens with a couple that steward their spaces and say, this doesn't belong to us. And if a missionary is coming through here and he needs space to work out of and we're working together, then 
This space belongs to God. He can use it however he wants to. When Jesus is Lord, we steward our spaces. Do you know that there's two other places that Paul refers to them uh, and both times it's, it's talking about the church that meets in their home. So in addition to allowing Paul to live with them for 18 months, they also opened their home to the church. They didn't have buildings like what we have right now. The church met in homes and they opened their home and they did it in two different cities. And can I point out, they were a, a transient couple maybe. They, they moved a lot. What we don't even know all, because again, it's descriptive, not prescriptive, but the description that we have, they went from Rome to Corinth to Ephesus, back to Rome, and back to Ephesus. And in Rome and Ephesus, we're not sure exactly, we know the first Rome they didn't have a church in their home, but the last one in one of the Ephesus trips, they had a church in their home. Each time they get a home, they open it up. They open it up to missionaries. They open it up to the church. Because when Jesus is Lord, we steward our spaces. So what space do you steward? Is it a car? Is it a house? Is it an office? Are we stewarding it like a kingdom resource? Are we saying, this doesn't belong to me? This belongs to God, and he can use it any way that he wants to. That's what it means for Jesus to be Lord. Everything we have belongs to him, and we steward it for him. There's also another fascinating thing about this couple. They're only mentioned together, like you never hear about one of them doing something. It's always both of them doing something. It's, it's like their marriage is on display. They're, they're, they're actually married and, and together they're, they're stewarding everything so that you can't say one without the other. It's, it's, it's Priscilla and Aquila or Aquila and Priscilla. In fact, four times she's mentioned first, two times he's mentioned first. In that culture, it would never be the woman mentioned first. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But, but here they are. They're never mentioned separately. What does that tell us? It, it tells us that they, they had a marriage that was a display. It was on display for everybody to see. And we know that their marriage wasn't perfect because there's no such thing as a perfect marriage because marriages are made up of people. And we are not perfect. And we know that they had to, inevitably they had moments of conflict and, and trying to make decisions about things. Perhaps they had business challenges or financial woes or, or children that were a problem. None of y'all have anything like that, but I know what that's like, right? And in the midst of that, they had this open home and an open marriage, not in that way, but a, a visible marriage <laughs> so that people could see who they were and understand what it means to be married, and what it means to have a family that's open for the things of God and pursuing and stewarded for the things of God. And can I tell you, it's a sad truth these days that marriage is on decline in our country. I was reading this week that it's losing popularity in the United States, marriage is. The number of Americans ages 18 and older who are married is down 8% from 20 years ago. It's on a steady decline. The rate of marriage in the United States is the lowest it's been since 1900. The number of people getting married. And those who are getting married are waiting longer to do so. The median age of a first marriage for men is 30 and for women is 28 and which is the highest that's ever been on record. So younger people are waiting longer to get married. And why is this? And it's okay to wait longer to get married. In fact, sometimes it's better to wait and you're more mature uh, with age, obviously, hopefully, and able to make a better decision. So there's nothing wrong with waiting. But can I say something to you about why it's happening? Because there's something underneath the surface that's a, it's a sociological phenomenon that's happening in our country especially. And I want to speak for a second to, the, to those who are in the room and those who are watching online who are part of the family of God. This is not something that 
is socially acceptable and normal in our culture today, but it is really important and it's clear that this is what God's design is all about. And I want to say something as tenderly and gently, but with as, as much conviction as I possibly can, and that is this, that the re- one of the primary drivers to that statistic is because people are living together, they're cohabitating, rather than get married. The common thing is let's live together, then get married. God's design is let's get married, then live together. And we're getting the order backwards. And when we do that, it's not that God wants to keep you from experiencing everything that God has for you. No, God God is not trying to limit us. He's trying to unlock for us the most deep relationship and the richest experience and the best intimacy we could possibly have. But that doesn't come with living together, then getting married. It comes with getting married, then living together. And this... And I know there are a lot of reasons that people are afraid to get married. I know sometimes it's pain in your lives and what you saw as a child in a marriage was dysfunctional and painful and hard to experience and it has scarred you and those scars are valid and real and I'm really sorry for them. But that history does not have to dictate your future. And God can write a new chapter for you and don't compromise what he wants for you. Let's be people who do it this way. Get married, work at it, and stay married. That's the kind of people we want to be. And so, men, I'm, I'm being told that young men are afraid of commitment. So they're not getting married. They're just living together. Well, let me tell you, living together is a commitment. So it's a lie. You, you are willing to make commitment. You just got to get the order right. Let's do it the right way. And young ladies, if you've got a guy who wants to live with you or is living with you, let me encourage you. Put your foot down and say no. If he won't make a commitment, find someone who will. There are men who are following Jesus who will do the right thing. Get married and work at it. It is work, right? Because we're different. Somebody's clean, somebody's messy. Somebody's a spender, somebody's a saver. Somebody's a nerd, somebody's a free spirit. Somebody's Disney, somebody's universal, right? (laughs) It's just the way it is, and you always find there's, like, we're not the same. Takes work. How can I outsubmit her? How can I outserve her? And she's saying, how can I outsubmit him? How can I outserve him? Got to work at it, and it's worth it, because then you stay married. You get all the benefits that come with that. Let's do it the way Priscilla and Aquila did it. Let's steward the resources that we have and the spaces that we have. I want to encourage you. Let's be that kind of people. Well, that's not the only thing they did. Let's look at the next, uh, at the last pe- section of that chapter, um, excuse me, 18, verse 3. I want to read that verse for you. Well, it says, because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. When Jesus is Lord, we do steward our spaces, but we also, we use our jobs. We use our jobs to help the gospel flourish. When Jesus is Lord, we don't, it's, it's not that we compartmentalize, like my job is over here and my church life is over here. No, when, when what they did, they actually leveraged what they were doing for a living for the gospel. In fact, history would tell us that their business was one that was seasonal and that would move. And so what they would do is that they would, you know, as business people, they were traveling the routes of trade and commerce and carrying their faith everywhere they went in different cities and different homes. And every time they're opening it up to missionaries and to churches, they were transient people and moving and using their job to do it. Their job was, was a means that they're willing to, to, to spread the gospel, using it as a, as a tool, as an instrument 
for the gospel. My question is, are you willing to use your career? Are we willing to use our careers for the sake of the gospel? Is that something that we can do? Can I remind you of something? We don't have a career so we can make money. We have a career so we can make disciples. Our mission is to make disciples. That's what we're trying to do. That's what Jesus told us to do. Now, I know you got to make money to stay in business. you got to work and produce at your job in order to keep your job. That's right. But you don't work to keep your job. You work to make disciples. What? Where is your work and how are you using it for the gospel? Priscilla and Aquila, they were tent makers. They found a fellow tent maker in Paul. Can you just imagine the energy that was happening? They joined their forces together and say, hey, we can do more together and we can use the resources. Everything that we make, we're going to use for the gospel. Some we're going to use for mission trips. Some we're going to use to help people. Some we're going to, who knows what else they use, but maybe they used it to hire people because once they hired people, they, they had the opportunity to talk to those people about Jesus. Their job was a place to make disciples. They had a job to make disciples. When Jesus is Lord, you don't just have a job. You have a job in order to make disciples. You use your job to make disciples. You know, there, um, sociologists are predicting, we don't know if it's actually going to happen, that post-COVID and the environment that there is for jobs and work, that there's going to be what's called the great resignation, that millions of people are going to sense a dissatisfaction with where they've been working and saying, I'm going to do this differently. I'm not doing this way anymore. I'm changing jobs. And there's going to be a mass exodus in all different kinds of industry of people shifting to something else. And I don't know, but maybe there's somebody in here in that category. And then there's a second category. They're also saying that post-COVID, that more and more 65 and up individuals who can retire are going to say, I'm done with the workforce. I'm stepping out of this. And by the way, in the next uh, 10 years, the number of people 65 and over is going to increase by 30% in the United States. 30% more people 65 and older in the next 10 years. So if you're in the category... I don't know if it's true or not, but if you're in the great resignation category or if you're in the going to be 65 and over and you're considering stepping out of the workforce or changing in the workforce, can I appeal to you? Make a part of your prayer. Oh God, in this next season of my life, give me a job where I can make disciples and position me just in the right place where there are people who need to know Jesus so that you can use me to carry the light to them. Can you imagine? You know, there's not enough mission sending money in the world. There's not enough to send the number of missionaries that need to go. There's not enough money to send teams to plant churches. The only way it happens is when tent makers like you, tent makers, not pastors, tent makers like you say, God can use me to go help somebody start a church, or God can use me because my company's gonna send me to this country or that country or this city or that city, and I can take Jesus with me, and I'm gonna be a missionary just the way I am, just like Priscilla and Aquila. When Jesus is Lord, we use our job to make disciples, and that's not all. In Acts, the last part of this chapter, we see another aspect of This is a different little piece of the narrative. It's an interaction with another preacher with a guy named Apollos. And it's an interaction that Priscilla and Aquila have. And again, it paints a little bit of a picture of how people act when Jesus is Lord. And here's what it says in verses uh, 24 to 26. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he only knew of the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When Jesus is Lord, we leverage our influence with others. We use influence. Influence is the goal. They were willing to address Apollos, this great orator and preacher. Though little we know about Apollos, he was an incredible communicator and and really well known for that. And yet they were able to 
to address it, to call his attention to something. I want you to see how Apollos is described. This is no wallflower. This is no easy guy to talk to. Here's who he was. It describes him as eloquent and competent. It is instructed, fervent, accurate, and bold. How would you like to have to challenge that guy? So how in the world do Priscilla and Aquila challenge him? They were able to correct him, not because they were smarter, not because they were more educated, not because they were more experienced, not because they had authority or because they had power. They were only able to address it because they had influence. Influence is what they had. Sometimes I think we make our goal to be right. I want to be right. I want to be pure. I want to be moral. What good is all of that if we don't have any influence? We need to make our aim influence. And these are not mutually exclusive ideas, obviously. It's great to be right and influential, which is where they were. But it strikes me the difference. They're tent makers. They work with leather. And this guy is an incredible communicator, and he's bold, and he's been trained, and he's been educated, and he's standing in front of the people, and he's speaking, and a tent maker who works with leather and owns their own business and lived in five different houses and traveled all over that region. They're able to say, hey, Apollos, we need to talk to you about something because um, we, think, we think you're a little off on something that you're teaching and we need, to, we need to hear the words he says is beautiful. We need to teach you the ways of God more accurately. It, wouldn't that be our goal? That maybe there's a neighbor or a coworker or a family member. And we don't want to be mad at them, and we don't want them, we don't want to talk about the things that don't matter. Why waste time talking about politics compared to the things of God? It doesn't matter. Let's talk to them about the ways of God and teach them the ways of God more accurately. They're seeing glimpses of the ways of God or, or distortions of the ways of God. Wouldn't we want to be the kind of people like Priscilla and Aquila who are teaching the ways of God more accurately? It also shouldn't be lost on us that Priscilla is named first. David talked about something similar to this with Phoebe a few weeks ago. This is, in that culture, for a couple to be named and the woman to be named first, today that's like typical, it's normal. It's Betsy and Danny more often than it's Danny and Betsy, and that's okay, it's right. But in that day, it wouldn't be that way. And it indicates almost for sure that she was the more vocal of the two and she was probably the more forceful of the two and the more articulate of the two and she was probably the one that sat, because this narrative, it names her first, she was probably the one who confronted Apollos and said, hey, let me teach you about the ways of God more accurately. How can I do that? She had influence when we surrender to Jesus as Lord. When Jesus is Lord of our lives, we use every relationship we have. We use every moment we have. We use all of our connections and all of our interactions. Not so we can prove we're right, but so we can gain influence with people, so we can teach them more accurately the things of God, just like Priscilla and Aquila. They were able to do it not because they were smart or more powerful, but because they wanted to make a difference. Andy Stanley says it this way, do we want to make a point or make a difference? We have to decide. Let's be people who make a difference. You see, we want to be listeners and learners like Apollos was. It also took quite a man like him to listen to what Priscilla and Aquila were saying to him. But we also want to be teachers that have influence. That's what we want to be. Imagine them. Imagine how they would create relationship, how they spent time. Maybe it was talking business. Maybe it was talking new designs for making a tent. Who knows? Maybe they invented a, a, a new tent and they patented it, right? Who knows the discussions they had. Maybe it was just discussions around the dinner table or late night discussions or early morning discussions. Paul mentions elsewhere 
when he talks about them. He says, Priscilla and Aquila, they, here's the exact words he used, they risked their necks for me. We don't know exactly where that was. It may have been the riot in Ephesus that Pastor David talked about last week, but we're not sure. But they risked their lives for him. You know what that does? That gives somebody influence. Their aim was influence, and it should be ours as well. And I want to speak to something else that it would, it would be um, not right of me to gloss this over because it's so relevant to so many people today, and the issue that they want, wanted to talk to Apollos about was baptism. And he was teaching and had experienced the baptism of John that is basically a baptism of repentance. It was before Jesus uh, had come on the scene and it was the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance is what the Bible calls it and it, a repentance was saying I want to turn from my way and turn to God and it was like describing an openness God I'm open to whatever it is you want and I don't I'm looking for your answer God and I'm looking to see what you're going to provide and that was the baptism of John but the baptism of Jesus when Jesus came he said I want you to be baptized in my name and in doing so you're making me Lord of your life just like Dan did today he's making it's a proclamation and a demonstration that Jesus is Lord of your life and they said we know that you've experienced the baptism of John but you need to experience the baptism of Jesus the Lordship baptism of Jesus yes you've said God I want you to show the way but he has shown the way and it's now for you to say I want to go the way of Jesus Almost not a month goes by that I don't talk to one of you or Pastor David doesn't. And you say to us, I want to get baptized, but I was baptized as an infant. My parents baptized me when I was a baby. And I feel like getting baptized now is disrespectful to my mom and dad. And I feel like it's going to hurt them or maybe they've already gone in some of the cases they have. And they say, I just don't want to hurt them. And I don't want to dishonor my mom and dad, but I really want to get baptized and they're in conflict. And can I for a second sit in the chair of Priscilla? And can I, with any influence that I might have with you, can I say, you're not abandoning your infant baptism when you get baptized as an adult. You're actually completing it. What your parents hoped for you when they had you baptized as an infant is that you would come to know God. That's why they had you there. They were praying, may this child come to know God. And guess what? You have come to know God through his one and only son, Jesus Christ. And when you get baptized, it's a completion of what you did. It's, it's, it's respectful maybe today God would say yeah come and be baptized and I want to encourage you don't delay let's get baptized in the name of Jesus and say Jesus is Lord over all because when Jesus is Lord of all it changes everything about us it's it's more than 10 percent it's more than just an hour or so on Sunday morning when Jesus is Lord it changes everything about us. Everything we have belongs to him. Everything we are belongs to him. For the sake of the gospel, how can I get the word out? So on the Tuesday after I told you the story of the Mustang, Mary Jo Anderson, one of the members of our church that attends the 830 service, was, was at the dentist. And... Um, she had a conversation with the dentist at the dentist, which I have been trying to, since I heard the story, I've been trying to figure out how did she have a conversation with the dentist at the dentist? Because have you ever tried to have a conversation? I mean, how do they, why do they try to talk to us while they're working on us? I don't get it. I had a root canal several years ago, and I mean, they open your mouth with clamps and brackets and everything else, like, I don't even know how they did it. And then they start putting stuff in your mouth. I, I don't know everything they put in my mouth, but I'm pretty sure they had an operating room inside my mouth. And then started to ask me questions, like they wanted to talk. So I don't know how Mary Jo did it, but Mary Jo sensed that this dentist would benefit from taking a step on his spiritual journey. Needed to take steps towards God. 
And she, she had heard through one of the dental hygienists that he liked to collect antique cars. And she said, hey, Ed, do you like to collect antique cars? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My church, they talked about somebody who donated a 1966 Ford Mustang Pony Edition. And they're, it's for sale. Somebody's going to buy it. You're kidding. And that started a conversation. And this week, Ed came to First Baptist Orlando, and he wrote us a check for $25,000 for that car. And we said, Ed, we'll take care of the, the tax and title and all that stuff. Because he said, no, 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 no. I want the church to get the full 25. I'll take care of the rest. You use this money the way Janice said it should be used. And guess what? You'll win because you'll do what she wanted to do. The, the people you're going to help will win. And, and I won because I got a beautiful car that I get to enjoy now. I got the chance to ask him a little bit about his spiritual journey and kind of like where he is. And I don't know where Ed is on his spiritual journey, but here's what I do know. Mary Jo Anderson knows what it means to have Jesus as Lord of your life. Because even when she's in a dentist chair with sharp instruments in her mouth, she's figuring out a way. How can I get Ed to take a step on his spiritual journey? What influence do I have? I'm using my space. I'm using my job. I'm using my influence to help people find Jesus. Let's pray together. God, thank you for Priscilla and Aquila. What a great story. And thank you for giving us these glimpses into their life. And I thank you for Mary Jo living this, this lordship life and everything I have, everything I am belongs to you. And for using her. I pray for Ed, a great guy, and just wanting to be generous to people. I thank you for that. And I just pray this experience, God, would you use it in his life? And I know you got other people around him. Inspire them to say stuff too. Help move Ed on his spiritual journey. Whatever you have for him, may he experience it fully. And I pray, God, Use every one of us. I, man, my mind gets overwhelmed, God, when I consider what would happen if just the people sitting here and watching today were to, were to start living like Priscilla and Aquila, surrendering everything we have for the gospel, the impact that it would make. Oh, God, make us that people. Cause us to be followers like that. We love you, and we thank you for the chance to walk alongside you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.